Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to this Bruegel panel on the interconnectedness between um, uh, economics and uh, geopolitics. I'm Jean Pisani, I'm a senior fellow at, uh, at Bruegel. I'm together with Piotr Arak, uh, who is the director of the Polish Economic Policy Institute. And we are also uh, with uh, Natalie Tocci, uh, the director of the Italian Institute for International Affairs. Uh, <coughs> with uh, Anne-Marie uh, Slaughter, the CEO of uh, New America, and with Alexander Stubb, uh, the, um, the dean of the uh, new uh, School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute in Florence. We uh, are going to be hopefully joined very soon by Dominique Moisy uh, of uh, Institut Montaigne, who has some connection problems. Uh, but let's start uh, already this, this, this panel. The, what we're going to discuss um, uh, today um, is uh, you know, how we should think about the, the way uh, things that were kept separate now interact. Things that were kept separate that um, the economic sphere, trade, finance, money, uh, you know, whatever is, um, belongs to the remit of economic and finance uh, ministers, and uh, what belongs traditionally to the remit of uh, foreign affairs and uh, defense minister, uh, so you know, geopolitics and the, the sort of power uh, relationship. And I'm saying they were kept separate. Obviously, they were strong uh, deep connections. I mean, the way the, the, the world system uh, we've been living in was conceived in the immediate uh, after mass of the Second World War, was that there was a connection that the, uh, the, the economic relationship served as a glue for what was called then the, the free world. Uh, and then uh, the, um, the globalization was meant also to serve as a, as a glue to the sort of broader set of uh, much broader set of countries participating in it and hopefully uh, being um, um, at peace with each other. Uh, so there was a link, but but the uh, in, in practical terms, the, the issue were looked at very separately. There were a few instances in which there were interferences in which, you know, uh, finance ministers or people dealing with trade had to deal with issues uh, that uh, had a much more uh, geopolitical dimension, for example, for sanctions against certain countries. Um, now we've entered apparently a new uh, type of situation in which the interconnection are much more present. Just think of a number of things we are, we're seeing uh, uh, around us, the trade uh, dispute between China and the US. What are we speaking of? Are we speaking of economic relationship or are we speaking of geopolitical rivalry? Um, let's think of, you know, uh, politically de determined investment and all the discussion on investment in the, in the EU, especially Chinese investment in the EU. Uh, sanctions, uh, the, uh, the Iran sanctions and the uh, interference between the, uh, you know, relationship between the US and Iran and, uh, and all the, the, the economic relationship there the, the was. Um, the discussion over Huawei, uh, <coughs> the Belt and Road Initiative, and the way the Belt and Road Initiative is at the same time a sort of foreign policy initiative and an economic and financial initiative by, by China. So all these issues um, are the issues we have to, to deal with now. So we thought, as economists at Bruegel, that it would be good to sort of open up the, the, the discussion and discuss it uh, at length with, with colleagues who are more, more specialized on, uh, uh, on international affairs. Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, Piotr and I are, are, the, are the economists, but the other, other three are mostly uh, specialists of international affairs, although Alexander Stubb uh, has done everything. Um, so what uh, I suggest we should do is to start by a diagnosis, you know, what, uh, what has happened, what's happening, how we look at issues, and then to move to the more recommendation prescription part for the EU, uh, what does it imply for this particular actor, um, the EU? How should it uh, or not uh, change the way uh, it deals with, with issues? Let me, before we move on, the welcome Dominique. I understand Dominique uh, has, uh, Moise has uh, finally joined. I finally joined. Okay, good. Uh, good, good, uh, good news. I can see you better than I can that I can hear you, but uh, probably it will be fixed. Okay. Uh, hey, but for this discussion, Dominic, it's quite interesting because on Zoom it says Huawei P10. 
Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 well, well, I think uh, this is the Chinese. They try to destroy uh, my participation. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I hadn't seen it. Good. Um, let's start with, with Natalie. If you can keep all of you, your, your, your initial remarks relatively short so that we can have, you know, sort of a first round and then, and then a, a, a discussion. Yeah, well, Jean, I mean, let me sort of start off by saying that, um, in a sense, this connection between uh, international politics and, and the economy has, I mean, in a sense, is as old as international relations itself. Uh, I mean, one kind of, you know, could go as far back as, as the Peloponnesian Wars, which I obviously won't do uh, over, over five minutes. Um, and, uh, and I think even sort of looking at a more recent past, one only needs to think of the fact that uh, the economy played such an important role, for instance, in spearheading the most uh, ambitious international political project that has ever existed, which I would argue is the European Union, uh, the role of the economy in, uh, uh, again, triggering or, you know, sort of the, the end of the Cold War uh, in many respects, uh, and, and I would argue also accelerating the Arab uprisings and question marks, the possible collapse of the Arab state system. So I think, you know, the economy has always been there, even in recent times, but I think you're absolutely right in suggesting that in a sense there was a period in the recent past where there was a degree of amnesia, and that degree of amnesia was in a sense first because uh, the economy, if we take the Cold War period, the economy, in a sense, counted to little in many respects. I mean, the defining feature uh, of the Cold War uh, was basically the security realm, and in particular, the nuclear realm. And, and the economy, in a sense, played uh, very much second fiddle, although, as I suggested, uh, it did obviously play, play then an important part uh, in triggering the end uh, of the Cold War system, and in particular, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then, in a sense, if we kind of uh, look at the last uh, 30 years, uh, as you were hinting, the economy played too much of a role, uh, too much of a role and therefore shadowing the role of international political dynamics. You know, we li did live uh, in, in an end of uh, history uh, world, uh, the unipolar moment in which uh, the, econ the economy was sort of ruled supreme. So in many respects, I think, you know, the period that we're entering now, or rather that we have entered now, is uh, in some respects one can read it as a sort of return to normality and therefore return to a situation in which both the economy and international political developments not only play an equal role, but very much interact. Now, having said this, I do think that it's worth reflecting as to whether this particular moment suggests something different from that the nexus as we knew it uh, in the past. And I would say that in at least two ways it does. Uh, firstly, and again, you were hinting at this, uh, the new major international confrontation, i.e. that between the United States and China, is very much articulated through the economy. It's basically there where the real competition takes place, at least for the, for the time being. Uh, it is not uh, in, in, the, in the security or in the military sphere. And in some respects, it's kind of hope it stays that uh, way. Uh, and, and therefore, this is basically how, I mean, obviously, under, underlying that economic confrontation, there is a political and ideological confrontation. You know, what is the system of government that can basically deliver greater pr prosperity? We kind of thought over the last 30 years that there was basically no question about it. And the whole point about this confrontation is that that question mark is being raised in some people's uh, minds. So I think the, the economy, you know, that, that nexus is becoming more important because of the very nature of the internet, the major international confrontation that the 21st century is basically going to be living through. And secondly, and perhaps in particular, and Marie, I'm sure, is going to be saying more about this, because of the nature, the, you know, the, the, the degree to which we are far more in, interconnected than we have ever been uh, in the past. And that connectivity obviously means that when it comes to the political economic nexus, uh, it is not, in a sense, a, a simple nexus, as we've known it in the past, but it basically unfolds in many different ways. Now, you mentioned uh, the trade wars. Uh, one, could, you know, obviously related to this, the sort of weaponization uh, of the economy as a major political instrument, at times even used by allies on allies. Mm -hmm. Think of the use of secondary sanctions uh, by the United States on the European Union. You raise the 5G question, the weaponization of energy. Think, think Russia. 
So basically, it is not only because of the greater connectivity, uh, but also because that connectivity really sort of um, uh, plays out in so many fields which are not perhaps strictly economics or politics, but everything that revolves around them. Thank you. So in a way, you're saying back to normal, but with a twist. And the twist is that the economy is be be becoming weaponized. And so the, the confrontation takes place on the economic uh, front. Um, Dominique, can you uh, follow up uh, and uh, give us your views? Yes. Uh, can you hear me well now? Yes. Um, I, I wanted to follow on uh, what was just said. Um, I tend to, to look at it from an historical uh, point of view. Um, in 1909, uh, Norman Angel published a book, The Great Illusion, in which he was uh, saying that war had become impossible because it was too costly, it was irrational to wage war in the first global age. And uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, four years later, five years later, there was the beginning of, the, of World War I. Uh, historians today, uh, like Neil Ferguson, are saying that uh, uh, Norman Angel wanted, in fact, to deter uh, the German Empire to continue on its arms escalation. And that's why he said, don't go in that direction, which is totally irrational. Much closer to us, I remember attending a World Economic Forum in Davos, where uh, people were saying, at the end of the 1990s, geopolitics is fine. Unfortunately, there is a, a geoeconomic crisis in Asia. If only geoeconomics could be as good as geopolitics, it was, of course, the time of the unipolar moment of the United States. And a few years later, in Davos, right after 9-11, it was just the reverse. If only geopolitics could go as well as geoeconomics. And the specificity of uh, today, in 2020, is that geopolitics and geoeconomics seem to be going in the same direction. They are not only interconnected, they both are going badly. And uh, if you uh, read uh, uh, Margaret Mac uh, Macmillan uh, and uh, a recent article in Foreign Affairs, uh, she says, well, we, we have to compare uh, the geoeconomics uh, with the 1930s. This is where we may stand today with the huge economic crisis we are witnessing. And the geopolitic crisis, uh, well, we have to look at the 1910. Uh, we are uh, on the eve of World War I with the rise of uh, nationalism all over. How can we face... Uh, that uh, uh, dialectical interconnection that goes in the wrong direction. And it seems to me that in this story, uh, in light of what uh, I've been saying so far, there are two elements uh, which are reinforcing negatively the interconnection between geopolitics and geoeconomics. And the first one, of course, is the COVID-19 is uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic itself, which has created so many bridges uh, between politics and the economy, uh, with people hesitating, uh, should we give priority to health or should we give priority to the economics? Uh, with um, someone like Francis Fukuyama saying the COVID-19 is politically neutral. Uh, it doesn't favor uh, authoritarian regime or democratic regime. What it favors is competence and uh, rationality and the need to be trusted by your citizens. But there is a second element which uh, was already mentioned. Uh, and of course, that is the competition uh, between China and the United States. 
if we have entered a new Cold War, this Cold War is totally different from the first one. Uh, the Americans, uh, nor the world, needed the Soviet Union economically. Was not depend we are not dependent upon the Soviet Union uh, economically. It is just the reverse right now. And, and we see uh, a natural interconnection that is reinforced negatively with the start of the new Cold War in which we live today. Okay, thank you. I have to, it's good that you stop now because you're, you're sort of, we, we're getting very depressed, right? Um, <laughs> uh, by by uh, emphasizing that, you know, we have this coincidence of COVID and, um, um, and the geopolitical tensions, but uh, that basically both go in the same direction and that yes. there's no side that saves uh, the other one. Uh, Piotr, um, from from the economic perspective, because we had two, um, you know, sort of international relation perspectives, what would you say on this issue? I mean, do you do you do you agree with the fact that we should change more fundamentally the way uh, we think about issues? You know, it's it's a difficult question connected connecting economics and geopolitics. Uh, Polish people are soaked in geopolitics uh, because of the education and, and because of history uh, uh, that we learn and. This is uh, always a debate uh, that most uh, people from my country feel specialists uh, on, so it's to be a, a specialist on geopolitics. But um, talking about those, those, this interconnection, I would go uh, with a parallel from pop culture. Um, is um, There's a great movie, watch it, uh, Free Kings with George Clooney. And in one of the uh, one of the one of the moments, George Clooney's character um, asks his fellow soldier, "What's the most important thing in life?" And he says, "No, not respect, not love, not God's will." What is it then? Inquires one of the so soldiers. Necessity replies Clooney, uh, as in as in people do what is most necessary to them and, uh, at any given moment, and. Um, I would say, uh, saying that there's a you know there's some deepness in this in this moment in this movie. Watch the rest of the movie if you don't know the story because it's quite good. Uh, not only because of George Clooney, but it's um, it's uh, also the necessity of some countries and our debate here shifted from uh, from the amnesia that many people had about the geopolitics of situations like um, uh, the war in Georgia in 2008 uh, between Russia and Georgia, uh, the intervention of Russia in Ukraine in 2014, uh, also what was happening with the World Trade Organization after 9-11 when, uh, when China became part of it, and when the American focus in international relations went from internal policy to the global perspective uh, but only focused on Middle East. Most of the scientists, most of the people uh, I know were focused mostly on Middle East matters up until the crisis, the financial crisis. And I would say that this, this is one of the focuses that uh, brought us to the moment that we have here, uh, which uh, the presidency of Donald Trump and then the discussions that we have come in very fast. Um, because it was like, you, we all remember Economy Stupid when uh, Bill Clinton was uh, uh, wanted to uh, take the office of the President of the United States. Why did he do that? Because the United States were in a recession. And, why, uh, uh, and while uh, George W. Um, Bush Sr. was fighting a war, and was very much interested in the global order back then. And what, it was the domestic matters that were more important to the electorate, to the people of the United States. And um, I would say that after 2016, we, we see that very rapidly change. It's not only with, with the one president and one, um, um, one party, but it is with the f focus of many politicians in the in the United States, and I wouldn't say that um, there is a possibility of a shift happening. But that's 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 probably in the next uh, next question. But 
um, what I would say is that uh, this discussion uh, also has a very economic uh, economic dimension. Uh, if Huawei managed to become an imperial force of the Chinese army, economic army, and managed to be one of the post most popular uh, companies uh, investing in 5G technology, um, which now the United States warn us against using. Uh, and as the Pentagon said um, in the new report published yesterday, that the United States uh, is now surpassed by the Chinese technological advancement in some fields um, uh, being a warning to the Department of State as to invest more in military equipment. Mm, this, this all uh, tells a very, um, uh, I would say, um, not good, uh, good scenario of the 30s or the 10s of the beginning of the 20th century, where we have a very, uh, very problematic moment in time and um, a possible non-polar world where the European Union has to um, uh, work out um, the business environment with China and also <coughs> work in strategic matters with the United States, uh, um, which, which uh, in some ways, as uh, Graham uh, Allison wrote in a book, Destined for War, uh, he, he coined the term the, the uh, Tucidides uh, trap, um, and he also warned that a rivalry uh, of a dominant hegemon often results in war. And uh, I'm just going to give l l end with a quote from another man who uh, also waged the war, and he said, uh, and it was Leon Trotsky that apocryphically said that if you may not be interested in war, but War may be interested in uh, in you. Um, uh, hopefully, it's just a trade war. That's that's what I want to say. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, that's a good question to to Anne Marie. Uh, you know, uh, what are we speaking of? I mean, many things we are speaking uh, of are related to the stance of the Trump administration, and I think for Europeans, the major question is what is attributable to the stance, the particular worldview of the Trump Uh, because uh, I think no one fully is. But great women think alike, so I'm actually going to under, uh, underline a number of the things uh, that Natalie said. Uh, first, just this, this overall idea of geopolitics and geoeconomics and how they interact uh, over time. And we, we have, as Natalie said, the Cold War was geopolitics, the 1990s, uh, more geoeconomics, and I remember Les Gelb, the former chair of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, really coining geoeconomics and pushing ge geoeconomics. But I will say that over history, economics tends to uh, line up behind politics when there's a major threat. And the Norman Angel uh, example is a good one, but much more recently when it was a question of whether the EU would impose sanctions on Ukraine and everyone said, oh no, the Germans will not do that. The Germans have huge business interests in Ukraine. They're not going to do that. And I remember telling many CEOs that I spoke to, nope, when the chips are down and there's a geopolitical threat, economics falls into line. And you are seeing that uh, here in ways that are hurting many American companies, but the, when, once it is framed as an existential geopolitical threat, uh, the economics essentially takes a back seat. So I, I start with that uh, proposition. And right now, you know, there's a, an embrace of a return to great power competition. That's Trump's national security strategy, but 
There are many Democrats who are very, very comfortable in that world. And indeed, I was at the Brussels Forum back in 2014 when Russia invaded uh, Crimea uh, and was in Ukraine. And there were lots of NATO people who were effectively like, this is the world we know. We know, you know, this is our world. Uh, it is a world in which we can uh, marshal resources and turn to our allies, and it's fundamentally more military. Uh, and so this notion that we're back in a world of great power competition, I think, uh, which is really moving back from the late 20th century, more back to the 19th century, but it's being embraced by lots of people in lots of establishments, including in China, because it's a much more comfortable world, even if it's a more dangerous one. So that is my, my first point about the way you, you connect the two for people like us, people, uh, the political scientists in the room or the foreign policy experts, uh, for those of us who are really formed in the, tw in the 20th century, this is a comfortable world and one that, that people will return to. Uh, you know, you just have to focus if you're in the United States on Russia, uh, on, on China, on Iran, uh, and then one with our allies, point one. I think the much bigger issue now is the is the the existence of genuinely global existential threats obviously the pandemic we're living through one now but climate change is every bit as big and those two are deeply interconnected if the people on this panel were 10 to 20 years younger and that may not be true so much of alexander and natalie but it is the rest of us um we would be we would be talking more about what you might call geo civics. In other words, that the young people in this country, and by that I mean the 30 year olds, the millennials effectively, and the people after them, are much more conscious of being extremely interconnected. They are also the digital generation. They grew up being connected. In fact, teenagers sort of move it like a starfish as a body as, as they, they coordinate their activities uh, on, on Facebook or now Instagram or, or whatever else. And they're the people who actually even argue about open borders, which is not likely to happen. But the way I, I've conceptualized the world, you can think of the chessboard world politics and the web world of economics, but also of society, of the social connections. And the bigger tension, and I think we will see this if it's not at this election, then it's the next election. And we'll see it in Europe as well as in the United States and in parts of Asia is a generation coming that thinks we are playing geopolitics and geoeconomics while we are missing those enormous global threats. And yes, it's true that COVID has reinforced geopolitics because of connecting geopolitics and geoeconomics. But the other way to think about COVID is the only way to get out of it are global networks of scientists, of doctors, of CEOs, uh, of civil society. How on earth are we gonna get this a vaccine and a vaccine actually distributed in a way that affects all of our health because we cannot reopen the global economy unless we have a vaccine pretty much everywhere. So my second point would be really, you can call it global problem solving, global civics, but it's the way in which global uh, problems require gen genuinely networked solutions that, are, that, that, far, that go far beyond governments. Last point is, um, to this issue of how the two intersect, particularly with regard to the United States, which is in a networked world, sanctions are dangerous. And the United States is wildly overusing them. Fareed Zakaria pointed this out in his most recent column. But, but if, you, if you go back even just a decade, China has a network strategy. The Belt and Road is not just geopolitics. It's really building relationships on the ground in many, many countries. The EU has a network strategy, and Natalie knows all about it because it unfortunately was issued just as Brexit happened, but it was a very smart strategy about how to build networks in a connected world. The United States does not, and the United States is not thinking in terms of connections. It is assuming that our political power and our economic power can be deployed coercively. 
And what will happen if we continue is that people will then start bypassing us. They'll bypass our banks, they'll bypass our stock exchanges, and they will make it increasingly difficult to use our economic power in the service of geopolitical ends. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for adding those two new dimensions, the one of, uh, you know, which was in the back of our mind of uh, global problems and the, uh, the the attitude of the younger generation with them, but also this um, contrast between the EU, China and the US, on the other hand, uh, in terms of thinking uh, about uh, about networks, which is which is very strange in a way, because the US was the very first to think in the, you know, uh, in the creation of the post-world system in terms of network, in terms of creating a system of inter interdependence that would strengthen the, the, the U.S. leadership politically. So the fact that uh, it thinks in sort of 19th century terms and not in 21st century terms is striking. Alexander, Alex, uh, your turn. So as I said, you did everything. So you're, you're the perfect one to, to give us a, the broad concluding view for this part of the discussion. Great. No, uh, thanks a lot. And, and, and thanks for having me. And, and I do apologize for my lack of uh, bookcase credibility. I have just moved to Florence. This is my new office. My books have not arrived. So that's why the shelves are uh, empty. Um, I think it's been a fascinating debate so far, and I can agree with most of the stuff that's come out of it. And I'll try to give my two cents worth um, from both an analytical and perhaps a practical perspective. Uh, the first one is I was reminded when I was listening to Dominic's uh, excellent presentation that we human beings are kind of funny beings. In a sense, we have a tendency to over-rationalize the past. So we look for examples from the past, thinking that we can answer them uh, in the present. Secondly, we have a tendency to over-dramatize the present. So we think that, you know, COVID is an unprecedented event uh, which could possibly destroy the world and we'll never get out of this. And this will be shifting the tectonic plates only to come back to it after 10 years and try to over-rationalize what happened. Because at the end of the day, I'll be, I'm all with those people who are saying this is not an ideological uh, issue, that this is a politically neutral issue. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's only about how well a certain government deals with it. Uh, and then finally, we have a uh, tendency to underestimate the future. So we don't sort of know what lurks uh, behind the corner. Uh, but that's why I am precisely fascinated about uh, this whole debate about whether we're looking at uh, geopolitics, uh, geoeconomics, uh, or as Anne-Marie very well put it, uh, geo-civics. Uh, I'm a father of an 18-year-old who just graduated from high school and a 16-year-old that just started. I can tell you that the language that politics talks today is complete Hebrew to them. They have absolutely no clue. And they're looking at me and saying, Dad, I'm not interested in ideology. I'm interested in climate. I'm interested in the networks that Anne-Marie talked about. I'm interested in globalization. You know, what's all of this stuff that these politicians are talking about? Having said that, I think the landscape for us international relations theorists, if I may elevate myself to that status, uh, is to understand that I think geopolitics has become much more diverse than what it used to be. Whether it's coming back to what we used to have, as, as Natalie said, or whether it's something new, I really don't know. But my first point is to say that I think this is actually in a strange kind of a way, slightly uncomfortable for the European Union. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is that the EU has often been branded and defined as a soft power, which basically uses economic instruments. They could be sanctions, they could be trade instruments, or they could be regulatory instruments. And we've sort of lived in this world and we've enjoyed it. Well, now, this stuff is becoming real. It's becoming the real geopolitical tool. So it's not so, any, so much anymore about security and tanks and military um, uh, power and uh, defense power. It's more about economic power. And this is when the European Union needs to start to put its money where its mouth is uh, and, and sort of act as a geopolitical player uh, as, as well. Uh, so I think, you know, it's going to be more about trade, international political uh, economy, information, technology. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the whole line between war and peace is now quite blurred. Uh, and economics is involved in it. Uh, information 
uh, wars are involved in it. Uh, uh, these types of issues are, are, are new. And that's why uh, I would argue that the implications of this whole new situation of movement from geopolitics to geoeconomics or, or geocivics uh, is, is twofold. Number one is that tech giants become global players in an interesting kind of a way. Uh, you know, we can't deny that anymore. They, they, they become somehow involved in the geopolitical, geoeconomic and geocivic game. So they are really strong non-state actors, uh, if you will. Uh, and secondly, I think we are starting to see more and more state intervention, whether this is the last sort of fight for uh, state control or not. I, I, I really don't know. But if you look at the world as we saw it post uh, Cold War, uh, it was very much a shift from state to market. And then with 9-11, perhaps with Lehman Brothers, uh, and, and certainly now with COVID, we've seen a shift from market towards state. And this pendulum, I think, is going to be very interesting to, to see. Uh, I'm optimistic, actually. Uh, and I'm looking at it from a purely selfish European perspective. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the European Union to stamp its authority uh, in economic economic geopolitics uh, or in the regulatory framework. Whether it'll be able to do that or not, I really don't know. But I do have some policy recommendations towards the end, which are wonderful to give when you sit on the academic side of the fence. Thanks a lot. Uh, be, be, before we move to the uh, second part of the discussion, there's something striking in what you, you, you all said. I mean, there, there, there's sort of two views. One view is we back essentially to the 19th century. Um, so everything falls into line. Uh, when there is, there is power, rivalry, um, economy, uh, the economy falls into line. But, you know, Anne-Marie, um, uh, I mean, the civic movements also. You had the, the Socialist International, you had all that before World War I, and everything fall, fell into line with the, with the confrontation. So one view is that the, the, the logic of the confrontation is that everything falls into line, including the, including the giants, etc. That's back to Angel. And the other view is that there is something really new in what we are, uh, we are living these days, that the global problems, uh, the existence of global civil society is really a different force we have to, to reckon with. Uh, sort of very quick views on this debate from whoever wants to take the floor. So I, since I've uh, introduced the the geo civics point and the and the social movements, I think it's a very good question. And we do actually, to Alex's point, we overestimate, uh, you know, the the newness of of technology because, of course, you could go back and say, well, you had the telegraph, which was revolutionary uh, in the early twentieth uh, century, and so. Uh, to say, well, now we are digitally connected, visually connected. Well, we were connected. We, 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 human humanity has become steadily more connected through technology, and this is a difference in degree of degree rather than uh, of kind. I, I do. I do think the other way to think about it, though, really is young people again. Who, who have started from connection. In other words, that their modal sense of existence is as connected to others, uh, as opposed to a world in which we've grown up much more as individuals, as individual countries, you know, and then we, we reach out and connect to others. But I, I genuinely do think there is a, a deep awareness of one planet in a way that I certainly never had uh, growing up, that I would really did see the world much more uh, nationally uh, as an American as, uh, and as individuals within the United States. And, um, you know, again, that, that I think you posed the question very well. Uh, the other piece, though, I will say, and this is a particularly American point, is, you know, we're about to become a plurality country. Uh, so that whites will not have a majority. And the other part, the, the, all the Americans who come from many, many different cultures, 
they also, and Barack Obama was the first to, you know, raised in Indonesia, Kenyan father. He did not see geopolitics the same way at all uh, than many, many uh, who had preceded him. So there too, that sense of global connectedness also comes from the fact that we're reflecting much more of the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can I, yeah, can I follow on what Anne-Marie uh, just said? Um, I think this division uh, between generation uh, is absolutely real. Uh, and sometimes uh, it frightens me uh, when young people say, uh, what is at stake today is the survival of the planet. And they are right to do so. Uh, they could add, well, why should I die uh, for democracy, uh, for human rights, uh, when what is at stake, uh, i.e. the survival of the planet, is so much more important? I mean, all debate uh, look petty, secondary in our eyes. And this is where uh, I think that we uh, uh, overlook history at our risks. And this is particularly true of the United States under uh, Donald Trump. I mean, there are lessons to be taken from history. And if you ignore them at a time, young people are totally concentrating on the future. There is a huge risk. And in that risk, uh, authoritarian regime can really advance their cards. I mean, if I, if I may just chip in on this, um, I mean, I think... Yeah, in, yes, in a sense, and then, then we move on. Very, very quickly. I mean, I think in a sense, you know, so far we've been talking about the nexus between international politics and, uh, and economics. And I think here we're kind of bringing in a different nexus, which, or rather a related nexus, which adds to the complexity, which is really that between sort of, uh, you know, traditional international relations, i.e. relations between states, and the major transnational challenges, in fact, the major challenges facing the 21st century are all three transnational in nature, revolving around climate, digital, and demography. And, and I think what we're seeing now is on all three of those uh, sort of challenges, traditional the, the traditional sort of interstate world is using those three domains as instruments at times of coercion, basically. Uh, but then, obviously, there is the scope for cooperation in their traditional interstate relations, despite the fact that all three are basically transnational in nature. Absolutely. That the theme of sort of the, the weaponization of, of networks uh, that are, you know, intrinsically in principle, uh, ways of interconnecting people that can be turned into into instrument of power. Okay, uh, before we move to the, the second part of the discussion, we have a, a poll among the, the those who are listening to this panel. Uh, can it perhaps be shown? We asked uh, questions uh, about the situation and about the uh, the EU. A sort of precise question about uh, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, actually and the potential consequences of the U.S. election. Is there any problem? Okay. Here is it. I can't see very well. It uh, remains fundamentally the same if Joe Biden wins. Yes. Yes. So, 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 can you can you show us better the result on 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 completely on screen? Okay. Okay. Good. Oh, it's it's being uh, it's being asked now, right? I thought it would be asked before. So the question is: if, if Joe Biden is elected president, will the geopolitical rivalry between the U.S. and China remain fundamentally the same, soften or harden? Um, and so in real time, and I don't know how many people have answered, not that many actually, 24? 24. 24. That's not a very representative sample. It seems at least among those, those 25 now, the majority view is that it will remain fundamentally the same. Uh, can we move to the next question?
And the next question is about uh, the second uh, theme. Uh, what do you should do in this context? So the question was framed uh, in the following way. You know, should the EU rethink it, its policies for trade, for competition, for the external role of the euro, and for, uh, well, uh, perhaps for, for none of them? So um, the, the answer is, should be regarded as yes. Uh, in this new context, the EU should adapt, change the following uh, policies. So let's wait a little bit. Uh, well, one question to the uh, to the poll because the you know we have a debate on geopolitics and economics, and the answers are only connected with economics, and there could be some solutions which are geopolitical. Absolutely, but you don't know. I mean, yeah. we sort of we we had Bruegel after yeah. all. Huh? <laughs> so people are interested in the consequence for some uh, of the economic policy, and we spoke yeah. of it interaction in this direction into sort of geopolitical changes impacting the, the, the economic system and the economic rules. So the answer seems to be yes for competition for the international role of the euro uh, and a bit less for foreign investment and for trade, right? Uh, but the bar seems to be uh, large, but um, well, uh, at least at least respondents seem to be, to be thinking that there should be changes. I mean, the non uh, in, in response is really a minority, uh, and then. <clears throat> I'm not sure it was the question was was framed in the way I, I thought it would be, so that you could have you could answer yes to several of those policies. It seems you had to choose one policy. Anyway, so let's start again with this uh, uh, poll uh, in, in mind and asking ourselves what does it imply for the uh, EU, how the EU should prepare for the aftermath of the U.S. election. And what should it change in the way uh, it runs a number of policies, especially economic policies? Uh, I thought this time we would start with Anne-Marie to tell us what she thinks right. the EU should do. Well, let me start by uh, disagreeing with the poll. Uh, I think actually if Biden is elected the relationship with China will change. I think so precisely because Biden needs to keep the left of the Democratic Party on side. And although uh, they were quite hardline against China on some issues, again, if you put uh, if, if you put climate change first, as so many do, uh, but in all the areas uh, that Natalie raised uh, with <coughs> digital democracy. We need to cooperate with China in a number of ways. So I think you'll see Joe Biden go back to a kind of frenemy relationship where we are rivals in some areas, but we absolutely uh, cooperate in others. Uh, but the EU, uh, the EU needs to continue the process of making itself a genuine superpower. My husband, uh, Andrew Moravchek, always calls it the quiet superpower, the civilian superpower. But never has it been more important to have a major economic power, the largest economy in the world still, uh, standing for a rules-based order. Uh, those rules probably need to evolve. China has taken advantage of them, yes, uh, and both the EU and the United States are getting tougher. Uh, but really, the divide in the world is between open and closed, economies that are relatively open, but equally importantly, digital spaces that are relatively open and borders that are relatively open. And, and I, I emphasize relatively because it's never complete. And those countries uh, that are fundamentally closed uh, and whether they call themselves democracies or dictatorships uh, is really less important. 
alongside that, you can only be relatively open if you do have a rules-based order, if you have a degree of transparency, a degree of participation. And that is what the EU at its best stands for. Uh, but that requires a steady increase in its ability to act as one. It will never be a federal state. It will never be as efficient as a federal state, although the United States uh, is becoming more federalist and we are seeing our states uh, increasingly insist on their own power if you look at uh, California. But it's never going to be 100%, not, not even close to the efficiency of a unitary state. It is still the best model for how you aggregate sovereign power in ways that only are economically, but critically important politically and again, socially. And you are seeing once again, Africans and Southeast Asians emulating the EU because there's really no other model out there. So I would say more of the same and maybe not having Britain will make it easier in some ways, uh, but you need to, to push full steam ahead on all the ways in which you can become stronger and more unified economically and then politically. Can you give one or two examples of what you mean by, by well, doing, doing more or being more uh, effective? So certainly on the on the economic side, I think the move uh, closer toward a fiscal union, a banking union, uh, the moves that are in in train uh, and with with issuing uh, euro wide securities is is very important uh, and and has to continue. Europe has to be the big economic prize in a way between the United States and China. And you see both the United States and China uh, resisting that, trying to divide in various ways uh, and tr or trying to get on side, you know, to the EU to be fully on side in one way or the other, or China really trying to divide Eastern and Central Europe uh, from Western Europe. So pushing ahead uh, with economic measures. But the other thing, and I, again, I think, I think actually the EU has been moving in this direction, this idea on foreign policy that it, you, you only really need three or four countries who really want to do something and other countries who will not block them. Uh, it, to be powerful, rather than thinking you have to get everybody agreed all the time, the EU has been most effective when those countries that care the most are given the ability to work together, to, to work with the EU's traditional allies, uh, and not get blocked uh, by other European countries, even if they are not fully participating. Okay, so you mean, you know, differentiated foreign policy, I mean, viable geometry foreign policy and unitary yeah. economic policy. Yeah. Piotr, what, what do you think, perhaps, you know, take one or two examples also in terms of, I don't know, trade or, uh, or investment, you know, to tell us how you think the EU should react. Okay, so first off, I agree with the poll. So I think that uh, during, with the shift of, uh, of the Republican Party and um, also the, the tensions that we see uh, in the society in the United States, it, it's very probable uh, that uh, this relation towards China uh, of the United States uh, could stay with us uh, for a longer period of time. Um, and uh, what I say is that, um, uh, first off, in the, in the European Union, we, we, we see um, some remarks or some policy um, um, uh, options that are quite... Uh, um, Disturbing from my point of view. For example, it was the, the the interview that Emmanuel Macron said that NATO is uh, brain dead uh, as one of the you know geopolitical um, uh, um, issues of, of 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 Central Europe. Uh, I would say, and this this was this is kind of like a, a disturbing point to make uh, in times like these, for example. And um, um, but. Um, uh, we're talking about geopolitics, uh, and nobody for even once said Belarus uh, here, uh, talking about this issue. And uh, I just want to chip in on that, 
that um, uh, you know it's not the United States flags that the Belarusians use. It's the European Union flags sometimes. Mostly, it's the flag that they don't have actually. So they have now the the Soviet one. Um, so this means that uh, for many people, uh, the European Union not only has um, the soft power, so the cultural advantage of being an interesting nation, but also sticky power. So this, this is kind of described in the international um, um, sphere, which I'm not that aware of, but uh, uh, I read about it um, um, as something when we're the, you know, the point of reference for everybody. And as the European Union is a regulatory superpower, because we can manage to impose some regulations on big tech companies, which are then used in the United States as a, as a manual, basically, then in some spheres, as with Belarus and the elections and the uproar of the civil society uh, there, uh, being unanimous against uh, the outcome of the, um, uh, of the election means that we can manage to be the force uh, doing something better uh, for the world. And this is like doing more of the same, uh, w what we currently do, but it's important to, uh, to still be uh, uh, this force that does uh, things like that for the citizens of Ukraine, for the citizens of Belarus, of those countries which are uh, currently in a much worse circumstance than uh, uh, many other countries uh, um, from, you, you know, from the post-Soviet bloc. Um, and um, uh, I would say that this is one of the crucial issues. And the second one um, is to not forget. Uh, and there's a, um, a Polish and also I, I got to know a Mexican proverb that uh, we're both from the same clay. Um, uh, that's uh, meaning that uh, uh, you know we we have many differences, but we come from the same background. Uh, and with the United States, uh, we probably need to cooperate on many um, uh, authoritarian threats, um, uh, given the next years that could be, uh, as I said before, not only with a war that's only on a threat to the trade, to, I don't know, to the technology that we use, or the, you know, uh, it could be something a bit worse. Uh, if the, we're in the 19th century that we're still discussing, because going back to the 19th century, Poland didn't exist. So if we're back in the 19th century of a discussion, then you know what's at stake here. Well, we can use this sort of comparison without drawing all the consequences you're suggesting, right? Um, Alex, uh, if we uh, turn to you, uh, could you try to be to move the discussion into something a little bit more specific of, of specific uh, EU policies that may have to change uh, looking forward? Um, again, I mean, you can... You can think of, uh, of trade, you can think of the euro, the international role of the euro, you can think of competition. I mean, all the, these things have been discussed recently. Uh, would be interesting to have your views. Sure. Uh, perhaps uh, I'll do it with two points. One is a general remark, and then I'll give five recommendations for what the uh, EU uh, should do in the sphere of uh, geoeconomics, uh, geocivics, whatever you want to call it. My general observation, I'll be a little bit provocative here. Now, my thesis is that we're going to three, see the emergence or uh, a struggle between three major powers uh, in this century. And the three major powers are China, uh, the United States, uh, and the European Union in different kinds of, of ways. And I think the megatrend that we're going to see, whether Biden is elected or not, is a certain demise of uh, American power, American unipolarity, American uh, hegemony. The United States will not have a similarly engaged and interventionist policy uh, you know, in this century as it used to have post-World War II. So we might be approaching a situation that we saw either between the wars or before World War I uh, with the United States. And I think that has a couple of ramifications. The first ramification, and here's the provocation, uh, is that the European Union should play ball. 
And let me use a term which I hate myself, but we should see the Finlandization of the European Union. And by this I mean that, yes, we are made from the same clay with the United States, and Anne-Marie will know this, I'm probably the strongest transatlanticist, you know, north of Brussels. Uh, but I think Europe should play ball in the sense that if there's a game, play 75% with the United States of America and play 25% with China. This is a geopolitical statement. So you need to play the game because if there is a clear polarization between China and the United States, someone will have to play not the mediator, but, you know, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, back burner there in one way or another. Uh, and that's why I think the European Union uh, should do. To my can John, and I'll finish. You? Yes, you can. Uh, this supposes that we remain in a, in a world where the, uh, I mean, the discussion, the debate uh, is essentially about economic uh, issues, or I mean, in a broad sense, including climate, for example. That you do not go into this sort of more security-focused confrontation. In which case, I think uh, the EU would most likely fall into line with the US. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. But again, I think the thesis of this panel and my personal thesis is as well that there will be security political talk um, and, and how would I say certain geopolitical machoism, but this will not turn into a, a confrontation and a conflict. So that's why I agree with Piotr here when he said, you know, rather trade wars than something else. And if we go into the world of trade wars, then Europe should play uh, the game here. Now, my five concrete proposals, number one, and I say this very carefully, uh, is to start thinking about strategic autonomy in a serious kind of a way. And by strategic autonomy, I do not mean protectionism, but I mean that we need to be aware of the realities uh, of um, geoeconomics. I wrote in 2016 a column in the Financial Times, which I provocatively called, for China, uh, Europe is the new Africa. And by that I meant to say that with the acquisitions of IPO, uh, information technology companies and other, there was clearly a strategic approach. And I proposed that perhaps Europe should have uh, a CFIUS type of an organization. Number two, use the trade instrument. I'm with Anne-Marie on this. We are the biggest traders in the world. Uh, the commission fortunately has exclusive competence on trade. Whoever the next trade commissioner is going to be, use that. It's a great power. Uh, number three, use the prerogative or regulatory power. If the European Union is something, it is a regulatory power. When it regulates, that means that a lot of companies fall in line. There was the saying earlier, economics falls into the line of politics. Well, I think uh, economics falls into the line of regulation as well. We don't live uh, in a wild, wild west of, of capitalism. Uh, number four, do everything in your power to make the euro independent and the most powerful currency in the world for the time that we still have currencies. I think, you know, it was a political project from the beginning, push it to the limit, make it strong, be independent. So if you want to do sanctions uh, with Iran, you're not dependent on, you know, the SWIFT system or anything like that. And number five, uh, use the power of uh, competition policy. Uh, uh, in the way in which Margaret Vestager is doing it, doing right now, because that's going to be the big game there. Again, it's an area where the European Union has exclusive competence. So what I'm saying is that if you want to be a serious political power, use the economic tools of uh, strategic autonomy, trade, regulation, euro and competition. Thank you. That's very clear and precise. Uh, it here, does here. not require uh, significant changes in the governance of the EU, right? No. I, you know, again, I, I, my life was based on uh, treaty negotiations. I did Amsterdam, Nice, Constitution and Lisbon. We don't need that crap anymore. The biggest advancements we've made in economic policy uh, and in fiscal policy have become through crisis. And I think we can continue that uh, as is. Very good. Dominic, your turn. Well, um, somewhere uh, following on what has just been said, 
uh, I don't think the biggest advancement have been made. They still have uh, uh, to be created. Um, Europe's ambition is to be the continent of norms, the model. But you can't be a model if you are not perceived as an actor. And even less so today than yesterday, you will not be perceived as an actor if you are not perceived to exist in geopolitical terms. And we do exist. And here, I think there are some contradictions uh, that are appearing to me. The first one is that the law of comparative advantages is uh, put forward by uh, the key European countries, in particular my country, France. Why are we in Lebanon? Because we think we can make a difference. But we are in Lebanon, and a uh, lot of people would say, in particular in Poland, uh, why are you so much inter interested in the Middle East? And why are you looking with some distanciation uh, with what's happening uh, right now in uh, Belarusia? Uh, Belarusians are Europeans. In fact, you could say there are more Europeans uh, than Russians because of their history, uh, because they were part at some point of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania. And uh, that uh, pushes me uh, to uh, say that the big question uh, for us in the future is going to be our relationship with the United States. A lot of people in my country are starting to say we should not choose between Beijing and Washington. And that pushes them somewhere to be, uh, to wish secretly that uh, Donald Trump will be reelected, which will make that position of not choosing between Washington and Beijing easier uh, to pursue. Well, I'm just on the opposite side of things. I think geopolitics will matter more in the years to come than it did uh, previously. And that in that case, uh, not to choose uh, between China and the United States is very dangerous uh, for Europe. It would uh, signify that we don't take seriously uh, the values uh, which we are always putting on our front, the land of uh, democracy and uh, freedom. Uh, and, and so, uh, to my mind, when I say uh, the biggest challenge are still to come, will uh, Europe tomorrow be perceived by others as an actor that matters in geopolitical terms. And today, seen from Beijing, from Moscow, and uh, probably from Washington, we are a marginal uh, player in the geopolitical game. And we seem to be doing everything that is in our uh, possibility to justify uh, that perception, uh, which uh, to my mind, should not exist any longer for all the reasons uh, that were given previously, uh, including the fact that the United States in 2020 is not the United States that existed before, with or without Trump as president. Would you disagree explicitly with Alex when he said the EU should be uh, playing 75% with the US and 25% uh, of the time with China? Not when it comes to geoeconomics, but definitely if uh, the Chinese are uh, moving aggressively uh, towards Taiwan, if they are uh, completely uh, recuperate Hong Kong. There's no 25 person uh, with the Chinese. No, we, I think we all agree on uh, that. That, that yeah. exists. Yeah, yeah. That's, let me just add, then I agree 100% with Dominic. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. The question is whether there is a space for the 25% in the years to come. That's a big question. Yeah. I, I, Natalie, I can, can you, Natalie, can you tell us what you think? 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, whether there's the space for a 25 percent, whether we are um, in the position to play ball or not, or whether at the very least we should be in a position to prevent others from encroaching upon us. The, the theme here that I think we're sort of dancing around is this question of European sovereignty or European autonomy. Mm. Now, I don't particularly like the term sovereignty because I don't, much like Anne-Marie, I don't really think about the European Union in, in, in status uh, terms. Uh, but, but I do like the word autonomy a lot, and I like the word autonomy for what it means. And it is ultimately about the ability of the self, meaning in this case the European Union, uh, to live by its laws. And its laws are domestic, they're European, and they're international, and therefore this is connected to the whole uh, rule of law, uh, international uh, rules-based system uh, question. So I think, you know, the question is how, how to do this, you know, and, and we kind of, you know, I can sign off on the sort of five points that, that Alex has, has listed. Uh, and, and, and in many respects, I think that these do reflect ultimately what the priorities of the current commission are. Where my heart bleeds uh, is, is really on the sort of global security and defense front. And the reason why it bleeds is that whereas over the last, you know, four or five years, this was very much at the top of the debate, perhaps because we were so pathetic at agreeing on anything else, you know, particularly when it came uh, to, uh, to the economy as well as, as well as migration. And now that agenda has somewhat uh, kind of shifted into the background. And whereas I do believe that we should be doing everything we're doing on the climate and on the digital, uh, I do also think that we should be uh, moving forward on the autonomy agenda when it comes to, to security and defense. And here I really wanted to connect this question to the how are we positioned on this debate uh, in the event of a second Trump administration as opposed to the event of a Biden administration. And I think in many respects, um, we kind of have it, you know, there, there is a complexity in both cases. So whereas in the event of a second Trump administration, there would definitely be uh, I think, a resumed European resolve to move forward on a strategic autonomy agenda, including in the area of, of, of security and defence. But it would be much harder for us to pursue it because obviously a, a, Trump, a second Trump administration, much like the first Trump administration, would try and do everything to coerce us and therefore to prevent us uh, from moving forward on this agenda. Um, but our, as I said, our willingness, our resolve would be higher. In the event of a Biden administration, I think that there would certainly be far greater support on the side of the United States for Europeans to assume greater responsibility, uh, particularly when it came to their surrounding regions and therefore exert their autonomy in this regard, uh, particularly in our surrounding regions. Um, but I think there would be an awful European temptation to sit on our laurels and simply dream that we've returned to the wonderful past that we used to live in. Mm. And therefore, our willingness uh, to, to move forward with this agenda uh, would remain perhaps as low as it is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is now. So to sort of cut a long story short, I think that whereas we kind of get it, you know, we, we understand what we need to do, perhaps we're not going to manage to do it, uh, on everything that is not hard, <laughs> uh, I think that we were kind of moving forward uh, when it came to the more traditional uh, sort of foreign policy questions in the previous political institutional cycle. And now much, I think, you know, largely because of, of COVID, which has really refocused the attention inwards rather than outwards, uh, we've kind of forgotten that the world has kind of continued to move and not in a particularly reassuring direction, as both Lebanon and Belarus in different ways uh, have actually demonstrated to us. Thank you. Let me let me turn to the question from the from the audience. There, there are several. I I would so, sort of like to start with one that so, sort of follows on what you just said and we just discussed. You know, if on EU US, uh, the question is uh, China is one problem, but are the perspective? What are the perspective for EU US relations? There are tensions in recent years on trade, climate change, etc. Uh, where could they lead? I think. Question, important question for us is, you know, uh, do we think there are sort, sort of, in this kind of environment, fundamental reasons for the US and the EU to have different perspectives on a number of, of the issue we're speaking of, on the, on the global trading system, uh, 
um, on the on the currency system, on climate change, uh, on technology, etc. I mean, is that deep, or is it uh, just a sort of normal nuances, friction that can be uh, between uh, two partners that fundamentally share the same perspective? Perhaps, Piot, why don't you start? Well, that's deep <laughs> in terms of, um, uh, well, if I understand it correctly, um, uh, you know, um, it's, 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 uh, everybody knows that uh, Poland has a very, uh, uh, very strong bond on security levels with the United States. Uh, this is both out of fear and uh, out of, uh, you know, uh, knowledge of the history. And um, it's very difficult to um, uh, always understand this position. Um, but uh, I would say that in many ways, in economic terms, the European Union uh, has a lot of to do with the United States uh, in the near future. If we... Mm, think of uh, security, for example, the, the point I made about, you know, the concerns that uh, the usage of technology and then, you know, we've been spied by the United States for, you know, the West, Western Europe was spied by the, uh, we probably were too, uh, for 50 years. But, you know, U United States, besides of uh, uh, being a, a trading partner, didn't use that knowledge in terms of any uh, probably uh, security breaches or, breaches or besides of uh, doing something wrong, basically. Um, I would say that doing more uh, with a different kind of uh, regime, uh, more authoritarian, um, gives a bit of, um, uh, of um, different possibility if we act the same, because it has a bit of a different uh, value system. And this is, I think, what's the, you know, we might uh, not agree uh, with the Republican Party, which works as it works right now. Uh, but we can, you know, um, uh, agree that uh, probably people in uh, re-education camps are not okay. Or, you know, going to Hong Kong is not okay. We don't know what China is going to do in the near future. But this is not, you know, the America... Uh, that we know uh, as it's not going to do the same things, and I would say that, you know, in the value system, it's easier to cooperate with the um, uh, with the with the United States, uh, but probably uh, because of the trade exchange with China, uh, and you know, we didn't talk about decoupling uh, and uh, all that, with which many uh, European leaders voiced to have more businesses in the European Union. But maybe this also is going to be a shift. Maybe we're also going to, for example, uh, create drugs and produce them in Europe with Industry 4.0. I don't know. Maybe we're going to have the technology to keep the prices low. We had the first on the first day there were discussions on this topic uh, during the annual meetings. So uh, I would say that uh, talking about the value system and. Uh, um, and the trust that we can have to a trading partner, the United States, is a lot uh, uh, better option uh, than, uh, than the other one. At this point, maybe this is going to shift and this may, may change, but there's a, a lot of second questions, uh, I think, in the very same topic um, um, uh, listed here by the audience. Okay, I just lost a, I just lost a question, but um, perhaps a reaction from Anne Marie on that. Yes, if you wish. Um, I mean, I I think that we have to be extremely deliberate about maintaining U.S. European ties. I'll, I'll start by saying that I second everything Alex said about how the EU should use its power and it should play. And one of the reasons I second that is that for many Americans who do not feel a connection to Europe, and I'm gonna come back to that, they will pay attention to power, economic power or 
military power. And the EU has more military power uh, than most Europeans realize in terms of how many troops it has deployed around the, the world and how uh, US military adventures uh, really depend in many ways on European support. But sticking to geoeconomics, uh, when the EU developed the euro, lots of American foreign policy experts started paying more attention. And the stronger the euro gets and the stronger European competition policy, regulatory policy, all of that gets, the more Americans will pay attention. But here's why that's so important. I'm half Belgian. I grew up going back and forth to Europe. Most Americans, educated Americans of my generation, part of, of finishing your education was the European Grand Tour. American history was completely bound up with Europe and most American immigration, and, and there, Piotr, you will know, the Polish American community is extremely strong. Uh, all the, they were, the, Originally, the Anglo-Saxon and French uh, really are the basis of, our, of, of Americans, and then, of course, it expands through Europe. But I cannot emphasize this enough. We are becoming a different country already by 2027, whites will not be a majority of Americans under 30. And that's already true today under, of under 18. And so the, the you know, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx Americans, when they look at America's history and they look at their own social ties, those are not to Europe. Or if they are to Europe, they're to Afro-Europeans or Asian Europeans uh, or Arab Europeans, uh, and uh, there are relatively fewer. But that means that the social glue and the historical glue that has underpinned our economic and political relations is disappearing. So without a very deliberate effort uh, to cultivate ties among new generations of Europeans and new generations of Americans, and just wait until you see what the Biden administration is going to look like in terms of who's actually in it uh, if he wins. Uh, then I fear we really are continents drifting apart. Easier on the values, but the values, again, are just a piece of our historic ties. Thank you, absolutely. Let me turn to another question by Matthias Levin. Uh, how can the, the EU uh, effectively wield its economic policy instruments in an increasingly fractured and divided society? Um, will society uh, policy willing to remain open? So turning to the, you know, what's happening inside Europe, which is also changing in a way uh, significantly. Who would like to take that up? Well, I can give it a little bit of a stab. Um, just a, a small sort of uh, answer to that. Um, you know, we have a tendency quite often to, how would I put it, exaggerate or over-dramatize anti-Europeanism. Yes, it exists. There are strong nationalistic movements. There are strong anti-European movements. We're seeing anti-European behavior by governments, uh, you know, in Hungary, uh, in Poland, uh, and elsewhere. We're seeing a lot of EU bashing. But there are two events that give me, at least as an eternal optimist, uh, a little bit of hope. Uh, about the European spirit or how people take Europe into their heart. Uh, one was Brexit, as much as I hated it, not only because I'm married to a Brit and 75% uh, of our family has dual nationality, but that stirred emotion. I think a lot of Europeans at that moment understood what it means to be European. And it actually, if we look at Eurostat, increased the popularity uh, of, of the European Union. And the second one is, is, is COVID-19. I know it looked a little bit bad in the beginning, and I don't need to say it when I cycle down the roads of Florence and see Italian flags, which are still left hanging from the windows, because there was a sentiment that China was doing more for uh, Italy than, than Europe was. But, you know, when push comes to shove, we just saw, uh, I think, a colossal rescue package from the European Union, unlike we've seen any time before. And something which, uh, Jean, you and I have talked about this before, was put together in four months as opposed to the four years of the ESM. So, you know, Europe is doing kind of good stuff. So I, I think to answer the question, uh, we're not ever going to become a utopia, especially a utopia whereby national leaders are going to say, thank you, Brussels, you just did it for me. I love you. Uh, there's always going to be Brussels bashing. 
Uh, but I think this will drag, and I, I'm with Anne-Marie on this, it'll drag the younger generation uh, along uh, in this sort of uh, geo-civic European network. So I'm not excessively worried about it. Hopefully I'm not naive and too optimistic. Thank you. Uh, let me check if I have another question. There is a question by Roberto Castaldi on the International Monetary System, but it's uh, sort of getting late to address uh, such a, a highly uh, specific and technical issue. Um, well, another question on the, on the role of the euro. So perhaps we should be addressing it nevertheless. Uh, you know, I mean, you mentioned that, the, the, the euro. Um, what, I mean, what sort of level of priority should we be putting on, on that, which is a sort of uh, traditionally that's a grand project of the, of the EU um, over the last uh, 30 years. I mean, that's a most uh, you know, ambitious uh, project. Is it time to turn it into something of a different dimension, and, and why? So, Alex, you, you gave your view already. Perhaps we could uh, hear Jean, you. I think we want to hear your view on this, man. Jean, okay, you, you know, you are Mr. Can, Euro. We I will can give, give us your two cents. Yeah, I, I think so, yes. I do, I do think it's... Uh, uh, I think it was very appropriate for the first decades to say we're building the euro internally uh, and we're not trying to push it externally. Uh, you know, neither encourage nor, nor discourage. I think first that the world has changed and our partners need to know what kind of currency the euro is. You know, is it a currency you can build on if you want to have an alternative to the US dollar, which means in terms of crisis, is the EU going to provide you liquidity in euros, which is you know, absolutely needed uh, if your banks are using the, the, the euro? Uh, so th those are important questions. And, and this is an acid test for the, for the euro, because it means mm. the ECB has to have a mandate to do that. It means taking some risk as we know from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, when it does it, has the backing of the Treasury. So is there backing from some sort of a, a European Treasury, or at least the backing by the finance minister to say, OK, you're taking the risk, we, we are behind you. The, the, the ECB has no mandate for that. So why should we be doing that? Because we're entering a world in which uh, you know, this issue of currency um, uh, competition and the issue of using your currency as a way to enforce some of your domestic preferences is becoming uh, more present. We tended to regard the US dollar as a sort of a global public good. Uh, it is still largely a global public good, but it's also an instrument of the, of the US uh, administration. And the renminbi is certainly it's much more an instrument of Chinese power than anything else at present. It's not really a currency. I mean, it's not an international currency, but an instru it's an instrument of, of Chinese power. So I think in this kind of world, we have to change our attitude to, to, yeah. towards the euro. So perhaps now I put my view forward. Perhaps there are disagreements uh, in the panel, and then we, we end on this, on this note. Who wants to take the floor? May, may I chip Piotr. on that just, just shortly? So uh, as an as a, um, e uh, economist from a country that doesn't have the euro but is part of the European Union, I would say that I agree with that. So if we have a political project of the, Europe of, of the euro, um, we have um, you know, political resentment towards the European Union in some EU uh, eurozone member states, um, there are two options. You can either go further with the process or go back. Uh, Going back is a bit tricky uh, with a monetary union, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not going to go into into details. But we all probably know that this is this is a very um, uh, very complicated process. Uh, but if we do what Alex is uh, proposing, so doing 75% of things uh, with the United States and 25 with the with China, it means that if China is still a humble giant. Uh, which, uh, with whom we can trade easily, then having a more um, uh, a currency that they can use, for example, sometimes could be useful, and this will, could also bring influence of the European Union. We're coming to a close. Uh, 
Any pressing uh, need to express a view on this particular question or One on the thing, broad topic? One thing, if I may. Yes, please. One thing. Uh, it may be naive to believe that China is going to remain, if it still is, an humble giant. It is a giant yeah. and is less humble than ever. And uh, it's not going in the right direction and is not going to go in the right direction. So uh, uh, we have to face a reality principle. Natalie, anything you want to say? She's left. Most probably she's left. No, 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 I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Uh, I'm here, but no, nothing to add. OK. Good. Let me let me thank uh, all the panelists. We had a very broad topic, so we did not exhaust by far uh, the list of questions we could have addressed. But I think we we went some way, and uh, I think there was a number of points on which there was a certain degree of consensus in 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 the panel. Even so, at the start, uh, my uh, sort of depiction of the uh, of, of, of the landscape was was challenged i don't think this was a very deep disagreement on a number of other issues and on, on, on the perspective i think we we, we sort of uh, agreed that we have entered a different world um, and that in this world with the u.s changing uh, and changing also for fundamental domestic reasons that uh, Anne marie just emphasized with China changing, uh, as Dominique just said, you know, becoming much more assertive, this has profound implication for the EU. That doesn't require the EU to become something it is not. Uh, you know, we're not saying the EU should become a super state, but the EU should make full use of the instruments it has and should be very realistic in its assessment of the environment in which it has to, to behave. And it has to take into account, I would say, the geopolitical dimension in its economic policies. So it's not creating instruments that do not exist, but it's taking into account this, uh, this, this uh, new dimension uh, in trade, in the currency um, uh, policy, uh, in competition policy, in technology, etc. So that's something you know, that should very much and actually is being discussed uh, under different nicknames in the European jargon uh, in the agenda of the, of the EU uh, for this commission and beyond. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, and I think that's a closing panel for the day in the Bruegel uh, meeting, but it continues tomorrow. So, uh, you know, see you tomorrow for those who are listening and, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. This was great. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you later.